when that uh, happened? Well, the candy bar experience, uh, I, was, I was 10 years old and, you know, selling uh, door to door. Uh, one thing that really kind of changed was a game changer for me was a new business opened up inside our town. And uh, that business was called Sam's Club. And does anyone have any idea what they sell in bulk at Sam's Club? Candy bars. So when my parents took me there and I walked down the aisle and literally saw that I, you know, all this candy, um, this idea came to me that I could buy the inventory and actually go up and set honor box candy systems through little businesses uh, in our town. And that later turned into a vending route um, where I actually had my own vending machines. And uh, from that, um, when I was 16 years old, I had had uh, eight candy machines and I also had... um, 10 or so pop or soda machines and I didn't even have a driver's license at that point so I had to had a dilemma and I had to find uh, uh, actually hired my first employee um, to actually drive me around so I could stock and take care of those machines so really for me you know being in the yeah uh, well well, thank you yeah you know it's just at school and uh, like you get into this car and drive around exactly exactly Yeah. First, uh, I really like what you talked about problems because so many times people, they have problems and they stop there and that, that's basically mm. complaining. But, you know, the entrepreneur is constantly trying to find out people's problem, their deepest problem, what keeps them up at night because those are where the opportunities are going to be. Also, you mentioned a, a mentor. When I mm. was 16 years old, I was just getting started, but I didn't even think about the idea of mentors. How did you find this person uh, in real estate? I started with family friends first. I think that was easiest is that, you know, I could go to my mom and dad and ask them for advice and even some of my teachers and people at school. Uh, But really for me, it was just asking them to take them out to lunch. And, you know, I had heard other people give that advice. But what I did is I, you know, called up this uh, real estate broker and introduced myself and said that I was very impressed with what he what he had done and who he was in the community. And I asked him, would you mind if I would could take you out to lunch? And here's one of the coolest things about that was that we went out to lunch and I was able to ask him a lot of questions. And he also would ask questions of me. But guess who picked up the tab? He did. And that was even cooler, too. I didn't expect that. But, you know, that's oftentimes with mentors is that, you know, simply just taking the courage and reaching out and asking them in a professional and courteous way. You'd be amazed at how many doors that opens for a young person. That must have been pretty crazy. You're 16, 17, and go ahead and buying a, a bank building. Most people, are, are, you know, they're just starting out. They're begging the bank for money. Uh, how did you get over maybe age discrimination at that age? Maybe at this age you could drive, but they could still tell you're pretty young. Yeah, I, I think it's a great, great question. I, I had a lot of resistance you know, starting out, but I found out most of those fears were within me thinking that I'm too young, I'm too inexperienced, um, people won't listen to me. But I, I tried to go in being very respectful and also doing my own homework, but building a team. And I think it's real important that any business, as you're starting up, that you seek and find good advisors that can surround you. So, you know, in my case, um, in terms of my mentor, he introduced me to an attorney. Um, I also was introduced to an accountant, someone that really understood um, finances and money. And then other community leaders, um, many many of them were retired and really looking for something to do. So by me taking all that experience and plugging in some energy and some innovation, we were able to build really a, a true team to revitalize the community and to really launch my company. So for me, it was just building that right that right group of people to help um, you know, give me advice and, and then also um, you know, provide the credibility as I was going out and, and trying to you know, create, create the projects. I'm a big believer in real estate, but it is a market like anything else. It goes up and it goes down. And I think it's important that any property that you're looking at that, you know, you, you either work with a realtor or work with someone who has knowledge as you're getting in and learning more about the business um, and, 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 you know, books to familiarize yourself with it. I mentioned Rich Dad, Poor Dad earlier. Um, anything related to the Robert Kiyosaki line of, um, of materials is really good stuff. 
But uh, yeah, I, I believe real estate's a great vehicle. It's not the only vehicle, but I think many people have achieved a, quite a bit of financial success um, investing in real estate. And I'd like to give a specific example. I know recently you acquired, uh, actually, I don't even know if you're in the process now, a 500,000 square foot real estate property. So now is a great time to uh, find those incredible deals. Can you talk about well, that's that right. deal so we can get a specific example? Well, sure. Manufacturing in the U.S. is really struggling right now. So in terms of property that has been used for manufacturing, industrial parks, um, you know, large factory buildings, they're going for 10 cents on the dollar in some cases, particularly in the Midwest where I'm from. Um, we purchased a, a factory that was used um, for steel making and the building's in great shape. It's got a great environmental clearance report. There's really no issues, but there aren't any buyers out in the market because they don't feel that manufacturing is going to be coming back. So um, seeing this building sit empty in the community and uh, over 800 people that work there really bothered me. Um, so I attended a public auction for it to be sold and bought it. And now we are in the phase of doing a needs assessment study to see what it could be created into. And um, maybe it's a combination. You know, one thing that's happening in our area is the development of wind towers. They're building uh, wind towers, and we're in discussion with a company to use this facility as a staging area for when they bring in the turbines and the metal and the equipment. Um, so it really is kind of thinking outside the box. Just because one industry is dying and, and maybe struggling at this point, what are new industries that could take advantage and use that? And can you give an idea of how much of a discount you, you may have received on that? Well, it, it, it's always up to speculation in terms of how things are appraised. But, you know, this property was appraised at $1.4 million about two years ago. And, uh, you know, today in the neighborhood, you know, selling for around three fifty. dollars So you can see, again, I'm not, not the math wizard there, but you can see that there's a you know, significant discount on that particular site. And there are many others, you know, properties that are going through foreclosure right now. There's, there's a lot of churn in the market. And it's really, if you're a buyer, it's really looking into um, you know, using technology, using the website to see what other properties are selling for. And a lot of times, you know, a property may be in another community and uh, I may not have the time or want to pay the money or the mileage to travel there. So I use Google. And what I do is I type that address into Google. Um, I use Google Street View. And uh, so if you go into Google and you go to Google Maps and you drag the little guy in the corner down to the street view, put him right on the map, it will actually show you a drive-by appearance of what that property looks like. Now, you know, five years ago, these tools were not available to us. I mean, you actually had to physically get in your car and go drive somewhere. So just think about the application of when you want to look at a neighboring property, a business in another area, you know, using Google Street View is one way that you can actually get a really good, you know, view of a property um, without even having to go there. And I know one thing that may be going through people's mind is, okay, real estate's a great vehicle, but I don't have any money to get started. Do you think it's realistic for people to get involved in real estate if they don't really have any money and not the best credit at this point in their life? Well, the reason why the, many of the pundits say the foreclosure crisis happened is because money was too accessible and you know people were able to, to not put any money down and get mortgages and loans. So in saying that, um, you know, the, the market has corrected itself and it is more difficult to get financing for real estate today. Uh, one, some things that you can do is to make that real estate play more attractive to a bank or another investor that you may talk to is does the property have income? You know, are there renters or is there the possibility the property could be rented quickly? Um, the other thing is, is looking at a piece of property that may be one use today, but could be another use tomorrow. So, um, you know, maybe it's a, a farm that's right outside of the corporation limit or the, the city limit in your town that, you know, could be developed into a commercial area. Um, you know, there, there are lots of sleeping opportunities like that. And I think that's creating the compelling argument. If you're going to invest or find other people to invest with you, um, why would they want to invest? A lot of real estate people get their financing from friends and family. Um, you know, also there's traditional ways through banks, uh, loans, mortgages. But one popular vehicle that a lot of people don't know about is something called a lease option 
or a land contract. And that's where, you know, someone, uh, the, the seller will own the property and they'll sell it to you uh, by make you making payments to them. Now, they're still going to hold the deed, but they're going to carry the financing for you. And many sellers are doing that in this market right now because um, they're maybe not getting the prices that they want or finding the buyers that, that can qualify from traditional financing. So, you know, that's a really good option, too, is finding creative ways that you can get that financing. As a team, I had, um, you know, the mayor was really vocal and proactive in trying to find a new bank. I had city council people. Um, I had my mentors, you know, reaching out and making phone calls. It was a conscious effort of us all. But the coolest thing was is that this bank came in and how I was able to recruit them is I had to give them free rent. And you're probably thinking, you know, how can you afford to do that? Well, I, I did that to entice them to come to town. But here's the cool thing that they did. They didn't like the wallpaper in the bank that was there. They didn't like the furniture, the fixtures, the colors, the carpet. They went through and, and tore out everything on the inside of this beautiful eight to 10,000 square foot building, and they put everything new in. So um, what I paid you know, $300,000 for, they put over $350,000 of leasehold improvements into the space. And guess who gets to keep that money or that, that, that improvement in the property once they leave, if they leave. Any ideas? I do. My company does. So it, to me, just learning that one lesson was huge. And, and what happened when the bank was successful, when more people started doing business there, guess what it did to the other real estate properties that we were buying around the bank? You know, it was totally re revitalizing them. We were clustering businesses that complemented the bank um, with other businesses. And it really elevated the entire town. Not only was, was I a hero for the work and the investments and the risk that I took, but I also benefited from financially. So that was a really great win-win example. And that's the thing. There are many of those win-win examples in every town across the country. It takes a little bit of guts. It takes a little bit of work and learning and doing a heck of a lot of listening. So Jason, when I think of you and I think of all the tools, you know a lot of tools, but one of the, some of the best ones I know you're using is, do you have an idea what I'm gonna say? <laughs> video, something with video? Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. You know, you use video in so many creative ways. Uh, why do you use video so much? Why is it important? Why should people th think about video when they think about starting a business? I, I love video because I think that you can see facial expressions. You can see people are very visual. So one of the, the, the quick and dirty recommendations is go out. If you've not experienced or played with a flip video camera, it's F-L-I-P and it is less than $100. In fact, I just saw them Best Buy $69.95 as of today and one of the Best Buys that I was at. Um, this device has got a USB port on it. You can record, and the newer ones, up to two hours of HD quality video. And what's so great about it, it's you know, no bigger than this, and you can hold it up. Um, how I use the Flip and ways that entrepreneurs can use Flip is to capture testimonials. So think about as you're creating your business, if it's a web development firm, if it's a yard mowing service, just grabbing one of your customers and ask them, hey, can I shoot a quick you know, 30 second to one minute testimonial of you speaking about um, my services or my businesses, my business and the problems that I was able to solve for you. And just creating that video, putting it on YouTube, you have an instant marketing tool. And what does it cost to put it on YouTube? Nothing. Zero. And, and that's the thing is about once you have that content, you can do other things um, in terms of optimizing it for the Internet. So when you put the title of your video, making sure that you're making it keyword relevant. So if you're mowing the yard, if you've got a, a yard mowing service, you know, putting your hometown's um, name in that title along with mowing or um, mowing opportunity, um, you'd be amazed at how many people will be Googling your business and finding what you do and, and actually hearing a testimonial is a great way to do it. Uh, I also love you know using video through Facebook. Mm -hmm.